the real trick is finding places where you can instigate value creation, but then also being in the position to benefit from it. If you take the existing buildings and say, okay, how can we you know, improve these? That's where the good stuff comes from. Welcome to the Real Estate 101 podcast. As always, I'm your host, Patrick Donnelly. And with me today is a really special guest I'm excited to have on, Eric Weatherholtz. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to have you here. I've been following you on real estate Twitter, lurking in the background for a while, really enjoying your stuff. But you've had a pretty unique career. I've enjoyed researching you. You studied history at the University of Virginia. You had stints as a short order line cook. You were a framer, an electrician's apprentice. I think you were a leasing agent and also an asset manager. Tell us about your early years when you first got started. I believe it was in the early 90s. And what drew you to a career in real estate initially? Uh, one thing you left off of the list, I, I uh, worked on a ranch in Texas. And it was a, uh, I got to know the guy about my age who was the nephew of the patriarch of this ranch. And he sort of explained to me how the whole process worked and how the whole operation worked. And it was sort of my first foray with, with commercial property. And I learned that they had the ability to lease out their property or lend out their property. It was kind of like a bank. And so they had all kinds of business operations there from cotton to watermelons to cattle to the big one was, you know, mineral rights, but they had solar, they had all these things. Um, and this, this guy's job was to check in on all these businesses. He'd ride these ranch roads in a, in a powder blue Lincoln Continental and then kind of report back to uh, headquarters what was going on. And it really struck a chord with me that you could create just through a signature on some paper the ability to participate in the revenues of all these different things that went on. I also learned that it was uh, something best done by inheriting one of these <laughs> massive ranches, kind of impossible to do otherwise. But I think that that concept sort of stuck in my mind. And my job there was, I, I also uh, uh, kind of got this MBA through osmosis in a way, but I would take people out on these quail hunting sort of expeditions. And most of the folks were these, you know, kind of titans of industry. And I would uh, hear, you know, sort of piece together the stories of things that they were talking about from, you know, whatever it was, crude prices or, uh, you know, bond offerings, house bills, all these different things. And, and I sort of threaded together how the, how the real world worked. And that was interesting. But the other thing that hit me during that stint was one day I picked up a, uh, went over to pick up my group to take them out. And it's these four guys, the ringleader of it was a guy named Jim Harrison. And Jim was one of the great writers and poets in American history. He wrote something called, uh, all kinds of things, but legends of the fall. If you remember that mm -hmm. screenplay and then, mm -hmm. um, you can look him up. Anthony Bourdain did a special on him years ago. You can probably find that on YouTube, but this, um, amazing character, Hemingway-esque kind of fellow. And then he was with another guy who was, there was four of them. There was a guy that was this French count who has done a documentary, sort of the psychedelic documentary about tarpon fishing in the Florida Keys in the 70s. And then there's this guy, Russell Chatham, who was a um, impressionist, one of America's great impressionist painters. They talk about him like a Gauguin or a Cezanne. And then there was this guy, uh, Tom McGuane, who's another one of the great American writers. Anyway, I take these guys out and they were so different from the typical, uh, you know, big shot oil and gas people. And it, I, I don't know how to describe it other than there was this vividness of how they behaved. And instantly we were, you know, cracking up and they were, uh, you know, uh, talking over each other and and as we rode around on this in this pickup and the this just wide-ranging conversation that went everywhere from russian literature to modern art to jazz to fly fishing to you name it to 
lots of talk about beautiful women and the, the, everything that was good and right with the world. I mean, I'm telling you the story 30 years later, but it, it had this big effect on me about embracing life, living life. And afterwards, we went back and, and we were uh, having a few uh, cocktails after at the end of the day. And, and Jim said, kind of pulled me aside because we'd really hit it off. And he said, he said, look, you can, um, there's two ways you can go about life and it's completely up to you. You can do what other people want you to do, or you can do what you want to do. And it's that simple. And if you want to do what you want to do, it takes a passion that is illogical because it's got to be something that's so ingrained in your bones enough to drag you through these through the difficult times of getting there. He said, look around this room, the four of us, nobody can tell us what to do. And we scratched and clawed to create a living. And they were financially amazingly successful, all of these guys, um, in a, in a <laughs> industries that don't normally end that way. But he said, only through this passion that we have for what we do, are we able to live this lifestyle that we have? And that resonated with me, the idea of you know, that little time on that ranch of one sort of getting a hint at one, how real estate worked, but then the sort of prod to kind of find your way and create a way of living your life that embraces the living part and not going through sleepwalking. And that sort of, you know, kind of kicked off this circuitous route that, you know, ended up in the real estate world. I love that story. It almost seems like an idyllic Job was that your job? Was that a job right out of college that you were doing? Yeah, well, I, I'd bounced around sort of, uh, you know, through the Mountain West for a while, and then ended up there, and then, and then that kind of led to a severe case of brokenness, and I needed to get to get more serious about things, and that became the uh, catalyst to get move into the into the real estate world. I love their advice to you, the, it, but it takes a lot of courage to live that kind of life. It, it takes going against the grain. It takes the courage of your own convictions. Do you have any ideas or thoughts on that about how you can, how a young guy, because I saw Moses actually post today about advice he would give to a young person. He kind of opened it up like, what kind of advice would you, would you give to a younger person who wanted to pursue real estate? But we could say any kind of passion that they wanted to pursue. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like, how do you have courage when everybody around you maybe is telling you like, why would you want to be whatever, a, a real estate developer? Why would you want to be a writer? Why would you want to be an artist? You know, like that's crazy. I think the, you know, the way that these guys did it was living, having enough conviction to live in. It meant so much to them to live in abject poverty to the point where they were then able to down the road, create these really terrific lifestyles. The great stuff about great thing about real estate is that's not really required. And if you, uh, you know, play the cards, right, you can, you know, times will be lame and you can tighten your belt, but there's plenty of ways to, to make some hay while you, while you, uh, get kicked off. So I, I think the biggest thing people need to do is not wring their hands about finding something that completely lights their passion. Cause if you're starting out, you don't know. And my, uh, in my experience, the people that kind of get there have just started and one thing leads to another thing. And the most unexpected things come from the, from the path that you take, you wouldn't think that you would end up in the direction that you're going or that you end up. But the, but the point of it is just starting. I think, you know, almost if you look back at, uh, any important moment in human history, any invention or anything that changed the world was all about came from some other direction. I, you know, like the, uh, uh, 3M post-it notes, the ubiquitous thing was, a, you know, was a, was a failed adhesive. <laughs> and so that you, you go down one path and it often doesn't work out and, and some other door will open or emerges from that. Good advice. Did, so while you were at the ranch, would you call it a passion for real estate? Did that develop there? And no, I, I think it was like, you know, wow, this is interesting. Sure beats, um, sure beats working for a living. How do I get started in that? So with, with nothing more than 
uh, let's give that a shot. You know, I picked up and, and, uh, actually moved to Nashville, uh, Tennessee made some, you know, weaseled my way into a job and that job led to another job and that job led to another job. And, and, uh, you know, you end up picking up some degree of, uh, expertise in it. So talk to us about that first job. I think it was, was it called the Roush company that you were working for at one point? That was an early in job. The early it, yeah, it, it actually wasn't, uh, it wasn't the Rouse company, but it was a, a group of people that had peeled off from the Rouse company. Jim Rouse was one of the great, you know, developers of, of our time. And he had, um, done some incredible groundbreaking type developments. And this group of people had been there to kind of witness a lot of that and took a lot of those lessons learned. And they formed a company that, um, at the time, and this is the early nineties was very busy because they were intermediaries helping lenders who had foreclosed on assets. So the other thing, if I was starting out, finding a place that's very busy, it's a great place to be because they're often understaffed. And if you have limited skills and sometimes it doesn't hold you back and they'll grab you and throw you into the game. And that's, and that's what happened with me. So they had so much business going on. So few people to do it. I happened to be hanging around and I got thrown into the fire with complete discretion over these very large projects simply because they didn't have anybody else to do it. So how were you, were you just learning as you were going along? Were you teaching yourself? Did you have somebody that was by your side or did you, it sounded like you had zero oversight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was close to it. There were some very bright, uh, really still some of the brightest people that I've met in the, in the business, but they were so busy doing other things that, uh, you kind of had to figure it out on your own and, the bar was pretty low, which was also helpful because the whole world uh, had kind of gone to hell as far as real estate was concerned. So if you could make it even if you could just stabilize it, uh, you were ahead of most of the game. And so if you could actually make something slightly better, it was a huge win. So it was, it was a great kind of training ground because everything was all options were wide open and you got to try them and see what worked and what didn't. That's good advice about trying to find a spot that there's just, you know, they're super busy and they just kind of throw, you know, like we need you jump in and, and you just, it's kind of trial by fire. I interviewed Sean Sweeney maybe a month ago. Would you recommend, and I think you probably know his story. He started early on as a receptionist at, I think it was an offshoot of Trammell Crow or a couple of guys that broke off from Trammell Crow in San Francisco. Would you recommend something like that to a young person? Like maybe taking working for free even with somebody that you really admire if you've identified someone and just offering yourself and saying hey i'm hungry i want to learn is that something you think is a good idea yeah i don't think it needs to be that that, that certainly works i don't know that it needs to be that draconian unless you've got the you know a lot of people don't have the that you still need groceries and you still need to keep the lights on and and so i think there's plenty of ways you know to get into the real estate business or really any other business, it's sort of finding a, you know, it, it all works under the same guise of the old apprenticeship model. So if you can, nowadays we call them mentors, but if you can find somebody that knows more than you do, follow them around, absorb what they know and repeat that process, you can educate yourself quickly. So, but I would think there's lots of other ways to do it. You can, you know, a low bar entry into the business is through property management and you can find a, a position with a competent property management company, a really large scale company also with almost no experience, as long as you've got the ability to work hard and you can absorb a lot of information being a property manager for a couple of years. We had talked earlier, I told you that we've got most of our listeners are kind of beginning and intermediate investors. And a question we often get is, how do I go about finding someone that can mentor me? Do you have any thoughts on that? Any advice on how a young guy could you know, approach you or somebody like you and say, can you spend some time with me? Any thoughts on the best way to do that? Because there's good ways and bad ways to do it. I think if you have something to offer, if you're looking for a, if you considered it as a trade, 
And so, you know, people are looking, what can you offer? Maybe you have the best thing to offer oftentimes is information. And I can find you information about something that you're interested in. I can uh, make, you know, oftentimes if a, if a, uh, you know, a young person can make it worth the other person's while in some form or fashion, that's the best way in the door. I think most people come in asking for something with nothing in return. And it, it, you know, that's, it's not, the, that's not the best way to do anything in life. Yeah. I think Sean mentioned he spent, a, a, I think at least two years around 2008, he had returned to Minneapolis. He spent two years just networking constantly. He had his full-time job and he said his, his second full-time job was just networking and just meeting as many people as he could. And then, you know, one piece of advice he said was, don't be afraid to reach out, like check in with me. I want to hear how you're doing. I know what's going on in the market. You know, don't be afraid to reach out and, and make a phone call and just check in, you know, keep, keep me on the top of your mind. I think that's right. I listened to your interview that you did with Chris Powers, which was great. I really enjoyed that. But you had mentioned to him a project, I believe it was in Phoenix called Postino. Tell us about Postino and the light bulb that went off for you seeing that project and went, what went on around it. I watched a property get developed from my office and the people doing it did a fantastic job. And so I kind of watched the whole thing unfold out, out the office window. And one of the tenants was, was a wine bar called Postino. This is by now late 1990s and, and Postino has now grown into a really terrific small company. But it was this bustling wine bar that attracted a terrific crowd, great energy. I took note of that and just thought it was a, a fun place and they did a great job doing it and, and redoing the rest of the property. And then driving around the neighborhood, I was looking for a house at the time in that specific neighborhood and pulled a flyer out of a house for sale. And it said three bedrooms, two baths, walking distance to Postino. And that struck me as curious that the top selling point of this house was that it was proximate to what this other person had had built. And it, and it was, you know, several blocks away. And it sort of hit me that this, what this small business did had a high degree of influence on the value of this property several blocks away and was not really capturing any of that value, but certainly influenced it. And if you said that that house was something more, was more desirable because of its proximity to Postino, gosh, how many other houses are more desirable? And if they're more desirable, how much value does that equate to? And gosh, if you said there's a thousand houses around, there's a dense little neighborhood and they increased in value. They were, pick a number, $5,000 more valuable, $50,000 more valuable because of what was going on times a thousand. Those numbers start to start to add up pretty incredibly. And, and so that was one was, wow, there's a lot of value. And two, this guy's getting none of it. <laughs> and so, so it was, so it sort of started a, a, a thought process of, how can that change? Is there, is there a way to, you know, sort of capture what it, what creates that catalyst? And is there a way to kind of put that into a model and understand it a little better? So that leads me to my next question. At what point did you focus on this kind of strategy that, that Healy Weatherholds is doing? You've, you got a, you've got a unique niche. How have you carved that out? I want to hear how you found your partner, uh, Quill Healy, Talk to us about how your partnership developed and how you have carved out this unique niche of developing really unique spaces and taking advantage of having a Postino type place, but also the surrounding development around it and, and getting that upside. You know, we had both separately been in the business of improving properties and capturing the value that that created. So taking a property uh, doing a full renovation on it and getting, you know, more, you know, higher rents for it or, or making it more desirable, repositioning it in some form or fashion and or building ground up. And we'd had some great success working together 
doing that. We had actually worked for the same company at different times. And so I knew of Quill and we ended up actually having separate companies, small companies in the same office building. And then we ended up sharing an attorney and the attorney said, you two should meet. I'm working for both of you and you're doing the same thing you, and you're in the same building you out to get to know each other. And so that was a terrific decision. Uh, one of the smart things that I did ha have ever done is, is uh, introduced myself and we hit it off and started just working on projects, you know, on a joint basis. And then that led to, you know, refining that plan over, you know, a decade or two and, and uh, creating a, one of the most satisfying long-term relationships that, that I've had, especially in business. So we started to see how one thing can lead to another. And, and some of the projects that we were working on, uh, one in particular, we made some modest improvements to a portion of a, of a shopping center. And that led to someone else wanting to be next to the improved part. And so then we fixed up something for them. And then we and sort of piecemeal and iteratively as we went through this repositioning of this shopping center, the tenancy that we attracted kept getting incrementally better and incrementally better and incrementally better. And so we saw how one thing can lead to another and be a catalyst for uh, what was in it. And then it, then the idea sort of came about that, gosh, it's not just within this property, that it's also what happens outside of the property because we'd you know, done a serviceable job fixing this place up, which made the offices around it more desirable. The uh, people that owned the hotels nearby were reaching out to us. There were, you know, high-rise apartments being built, not completely, but in to some extent because of what we had done. So then we started to see that one thing can lead to another and one thing can lead to things that are outside the four walls of the property and that the real value in doing these things is to the extent that you can, one, create a catalyst that has a halo effect on what's around it, but then being able to front run that value creation and participate it in it in some form or fashion. And so that's the real trick is finding places where you can instigate value creation, but then also being in the position to benefit from it. I think we've all seen you know, areas where the, uh, you know, picture some down on the luck part of town, maybe it was old warehouses or whatever, and then some groovy things have gone in and now it becomes this bustling place. And then all the housing gets built around it and all that, you know, all that kind of stuff and the offices and the hotels and all that. What is the catalyst that drives that? Understanding what are those things that sort of start that forest fire? And then secondly, uh, being in a position to benefit from that increasing wave of desirability. And so that's kind of what we've built our business on. I wanted to talk more about that, the halo effect, how you go about exactly creating these vibrant spaces. What are some of the features that you want to have in some of these developments? I've, I was on your Twitter feed and it, they're, they're awesome. You know, there's a, a outdoor patios and taco places and places to get a cold beer. It just seems like an awesome, I mean, looking at your Twitter feed, you're going to get hungry. You're going to want to go out and grab a beer and some, <laughs> get some food. Yeah. But talk to us a little bit about how you specifically go about creating these vibrant spaces. You know, so everything's on us is you think of a spectrum. Um, all properties can be improved to some degree and anything you do with a property has an effect on what's around it. So if you thought about, you know, if you lived in a neighborhood and you, and you, um, I don't know, took your house, painted it pencil yellow and, and covered it in peace signs, that would have some sort of a effect on what's around it. It would change the vibe. If you, uh, and it can be in other ways. If you, if you built some overscaled, ugly house, it might make what's next to it less desirable. If you did some beautiful renovation on the house, it might make the thing that's next to it slightly more valuable. So we look for instances where there is a very clear path to a large change in value. 
because you can you can do all kinds of work and maybe have some small impact. We're looking, trying to pick out the places where if you do something, it's going to have a much larger impact. And so we there's all kinds of ways to do this where we've sort of found the most um, concentrated effect is by clustering together restaurants. Maybe we'll throw in a few shops, but if you cluster in cluster around um, a common green space, food and beverage, approachable sort of fun food and beverage type uses that are active, indoor, outdoor kind of spaces that creates an energy that appeals universally to people. Almost everyone, uh, you know, very few people drive by some bustling patio that smells great with people having a good time and, and say, oh, that's horrible. Uh, roll up the windows. Let's get out of here. And so it sort of becomes a draw to people. And the more people come, the more, uh, you know, and, and have a good time, then that sort of makes that area slightly more vibrant. And you have this domino effect of cascading effect of what happens around it. And so if you think about the, you know, the terrific independent coffee shop, they're really more in the, you know, yes, they sell coffee, but they don't forget that they, that they're really selling, you know, housing and, and offices and, and hotel rooms because what the energy that's created by those type of places make create for a place that people want to be, where people want to be, buildings around it become more desirable. The more desirable buildings become, the more valuable they become. And if you can participate in that, it's kind of good for everybody. Somebody posted, I, I think it was Sean Sweeney. It was a photo of, it was a French cafe, maybe in Paris, I don't know, but it looked like you were describing, just really inviting. Yeah. You wanted to be a part of it. The other photo was an American drive through you know, Starbucks drive through Express, so just like blah, homogenous suburban development. What prevents the kind of creative developments that you are doing and are universally attractive? Why aren't there more of them? What prevents that from happening? It just seems like a no-brainer. As you're explaining your strategy, it just seems like this is what people want. Why do we have like Walgreens and a Dollar General and a Applebee's right next to each other? Well, there's a financial construct that goes on and and and, and prevents uh, or or accelerates what what we have and, and explains why we have what we have. And so, if you're if you're a um, banker and uh, you know real estate's expensive, it requires you know a lot of capital. And if I'm going to give someone my capital, I certainly prefer to get it back, and I prefer to get back more than I've given you. And so then there's this reliance on the on the credit worthiness of the occupant because they're going to pay you and you're in turn going to pay me. So given given the opportunity to uh, yes, people want coffee. The idea of uh, McDonald's delivering the coffee and making certain that you're going to get the rent is far more attractive to the capital markets. Than the than the French cafe, who is some you know flaky individual that may or may not ever pay you, and the building's going to be too expensive, and for every reason, it's less likely that I'm going to get my money back. And that's and that's clear thinking, and that's right thinking, and that's why we have what we have. What we're saying is, if you widen your aperture and think of it almost as if a um, take on a bigger project, a bigger site and say, you know, for example, golf courses in and of themselves are kind of a lousy business, but in the right markets, selling home lots around golf courses can be a very attractive business. And so the idea of, of building a golf course as a means to create desirable lots around it is a uh, pattern of development that's been proven to work. And so we're on a, on a different scale, but with some similarity saying the coffee shop and the, and the taco joint become our golf course. And then around that becomes the types of places that people might want to have their offices or they might want to live or they might want to visit. And, and the inverse is if I, if we put a uh, mattress firm in a O'Reilly auto parts, maybe there's 
uh, at least with O'Reilly, there's a hell of a lot more credit than there is with the local taco place. But the value ends there, and it can actually be a negative value on what's around it. It'd be unusual to find a flyer in someone's house saying walkable to O'Reilly Auto Parts. In fact, they might you know, downplay that. So there's sort of this negative halo that comes from some of those more formulaic type places and what's around it in some ways can become less valuable. So those are the two differences of how we deal with. Um, so, so if we look at a much larger project and say, what's going to, um, what's going to make this entire area more desirable then th use that as the guide to how we, you know, develop the small pieces that become the catalyst for the large. Would you say that's your company's edge is that you're willing to take on those kinds of projects that maybe other developers just aren't interested in? You've got a, that niche that you know works, it seems. What's your edge? Can you speak to that? Yeah, well, what we what we specialize in is creating these these small commercial nodes that I'll call them and they're and they can be quite small, you know, from 10,000 square feet to a big one might be 40,000 square feet. And you can fit that, you know, onto half an acre, um, depending on what kind of parking is required. And so how that, so, so that's what we know how to do is create this little, you know, bustling little place. And then what you do with that is then being able to participate with what's around the, you know, is the property that's around it. And so we're able to structure things. So we have probably 16 projects in the queue right now, some of which are with municipalities. And that's sort of the inverse where a municipality has, they are the beneficiary of what goes, what have of that halo effect. So they can take, make their town more, differentiated. So a trade for them might be, hey, we're going to benefit by if you do what you if you do what you do, we're going to benefit. Our places are going to become more valuable, our property tax rolls will go up, etc. So we're willing to underwrite your project. We'll, you know, give you land, we'll build you a parking deck, we'll help finance your buildings because we're going to benefit on the other side. We're doing things with developers, other developers who might have, you know, we're working with uh, a couple of folks that are that are buying large office assets, want to activate them. They have a surface parking lot and they're saying, hey, you know, we'll give you this land. <laughs> you do what you do. It's a limited utility to us. We, we, we've got bigger problems than uh, we got plenty of parking and don't have a use for it, uh, but you do what you do. And then we'll benefit from that halo. And then in certain instances, very select ones where we can find opportunistically large chunks of land or property, then we'll take on the whole the whole process. But those are harder to find. Would would an example of that be Turner Field? You did the Atlanta Braves Stadium. Was that a, sounded like a pretty big project? Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, we. Um, uh, teamed up with a with a group that was able to secure that property in a public private partnership of sorts, and much government intervention had been uh, pushed. What was once a very vibrant area had, over the decades, been pushed down into a place that was down on its luck, and so it presented our group the opportunity to take a small collection of buildings, I think there it's 30, well, almost 40,000 square feet. That was the initial catalyst. And we were able to put in 14 individual restaurants into this little walkable stretch of buildings that had been vacant for 50 years. And by doing that, that created an energy that led in a straight line to 700 student housing beds, 100 townhomes, three, over 300 unit multifamily projects, a grocery store in an area that hadn't had one in 40 years, other shops, and we're working on additional multifamily and additional office space there. So it's a example of how a 
single catalytic small scale project led to ignited the uh, rebirth of a much larger area. So who provides the initial vision for that? Was the the initial part of the project, the 14 or so restaurants, is that where you start or where do you start with the project? In that case, it, it, it was, and, and our team acquired the Turner Field property. And then separate from that, the opportunity came up to acquire this, these adjoining buildings that had been used. The reason they were vacant is it was easier for the former owners, more lucrative for them to rent out the, their parking lots for, for game day parking rather than have occupants in the buildings. So when the, when the reason for the parking went away, so did their revenue and so did their, their building. So that came up after the fact, but the idea of, hey, here's some great bones on these buildings. It's very rare in a major market to be able to acquire at a bargain price, you know, three blocks of historic buildings on both sides of a, of a former shopping street that are facing each other and then have around it the all this other, you know, potential land for development. So that became, so then the idea was, well, let's take these buildings um, and we can, uh, we can go out and get sort of the best and brightest in the, in the, in the culinary world and create a place that uh, is, is fun and bustling and vibrant. And then that will lead to uh, these others. And it's a great case in point in that the, that particular three block stretch took four years, five years of, of hand wringing and agonizing and, and, and uh, uh, fastidious attention to the details of, of repositioning all those individual spaces, hand holding with, with uh, small business folks to get this thing open. An incredible amount of work went into that, but that became the launch pad that allowed the things of scale to happen all around it. So the, you know, all these apartments that came out of that, came out of that, all these residences, I think we're going to have a, we'll get office space and we'll get a lot of other cool things coming into this neighborhood. And you can draw a line, trace it all the way back to uh, the small little project of, of shops and restaurants. So are you partnering then with, in terms like of the student housing development or the townhome development, or you mentioned the grocery store, are you doing that development solo or are you partnering with other development firms to do the projects at that point? In each of those cases, we would sell the land to a third party. In some cases, we would have a partnership interest in the success of, of how it went, but we would either create a new entity that would develop these, uh, larger projects, or it would be an outright sale. And then we would, um, in some form or fashion, participate in them, you know, with some sort of a, you know, bonus or something payment, depending on how they um, succeeded. What we found is that having multiple participants makes for a better outcome. So a lot of times when you have one entity that's controlling a process soup to nuts, it can be a little heavy handed. And by bringing in folks that are specialists in all these other areas, you get a, uh, you have a broader base of buy-in into these, you know, large scale projects. So the, um, the group that we're teamed with is, is very talented, but neither of us could ever build townhomes in the way that the folks that we so sold to have done. Our partner in it is a talented student housing developer, but but being able to you know bring in a third party student housing developer has been you know was a was a great solution. We are in the business of building and developing you know retail space, but being able to bring in a third party retail developer that specializes in grocery stores was a great solution for us and them. It allowed us to free up capital. It allowed them to get a project. And then we can keep pushing the whole thing forward. I wanted to ask you, what are the criteria that you are looking at when you're evaluating a potential project in a neighborhood? When you're looking at a neighborhood, how do you decide if it's an area you want to invest in and start acquiring land? I think it sort of starts and stops at um, we're looking for 
restaurant sales. And so if we can go into an area and point to two or three or four existing places that are doing, you know, a good business, call it three, three, four million dollars, then that sort of to us kind of proves out the market more than anything. And then it's, you know, if a good operator can make that kind of money there, then our business is then finding the good operators and, and doing that. It's kind of that simple. It's not too far off of, you know, I think Burger King's growth strategy where for the first couple of decades was going across the street from a McDonald's. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little bit tied to that kind of a theory. Yeah, definitely. Do you prefer to buy existing buildings that need redevelopment or would you rather do green space development or you're doing a mix of both? Yeah, I think, I think the mix of both is helpful. I, I think the, there's, you know, they, they both have, pros and cons, building ground up, you get to control the whole process, get new, if you will. Rehabbing, there's sometimes it can be much faster on the, at least on the entitlement side. You can, by reusing buildings of any sort, there's a, there's a, a soul that comes from a project that's really difficult to recreate from ground up. If you reuse something, modify it, fix it up, it has a personality to it that's very difficult. There's an imperfect personality that's hard to otherwise replicate. I'd love for you to come to Columbus, Ohio. There's a, the minor league baseball team, is it was the Columbus Clippers. It's still the Columbus Clippers, but they, they played in Cooper Stadium, which is, you know, it's just the stadium and a massive parking lot that's overgrown and just decrepit and something needs to happen. <laughs> you, should, you should take a look at the land and it's, and it's in an area that's starting to redevelop. Um, you I know, there's it. cool breweries and it. bars and restaurants that have, in fact, one of the restaurants I like, it was an old, um, Epco, I think was the water company, you know, like the old school water fountains. They made yeah, water okay. fountains. Epco was the gotcha, company, I gotcha, think. Gotcha. It was uh -huh. an old water fountain company and they bought this building and it's not like a really cool event space and restaurant and, it's kind of an example of, of the projects you're doing. It's restaurants have moved in, breweries have moved in, and now it's a cool, vibrant place that was once really just run down with, you know, stuff. That's a great point. If you think about, you know, Easton Town Center is probably the best done of any Greenfield development in the country, or it's, you know, it's in the top tier. And as well as that has been executed, comparing it, to what you're talking about, which is a much smaller scale, but there's a certain amount of soul <laughs> that's lost in in building ground up that that exists. I haven't been to the place that you're talking about, but but I I can only imagine <laughs> that there's a difference in in the energy of those two places that's palpable. Well, it's similar. I live in German Village. I don't know if you've ever been yeah. to German Village uh -huh. in Columbus. That's but terrific. Yeah, it's a hundred year old brick homes. You can't recreate that. As nice as yeah. Easton is and all the brick that's out there, you can't create the whatever you want to call it, the patina of a brick road yeah. and the hundred year old brick homes that are all around German village. It just you can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> and we've we've found, you know, it's it's um a a friend of mine uh is just finished redoing his house. He's got two young girls and he was showing me around and he had this um you know, kind of goofy small house and, and spent a fortune redoing it with a terrific architect friend. And the upstairs in the attic, they made into two separate rooms for these, for his two girls. And it's the most magical little place. It's sort of this fairy land of going upstairs with these tight little, you know, undersized doors leading into these big open lofted attic spaces. It's really incredible. And it's something that only was possible because they were working within these, you know, this existing sort of construct that they had to deal with. You would never design these, you could never come up with the idea to build the space if you were starting, you know, from the ground up. So only because they had to deal with these, these kind of weird and goofy upper level attic spaces were they then able to come up with the idea to create what they, what they did. And the same thing happens in commercial property of, if you take the 
existing buildings and say, okay, how can we, you know, improve these? That's where the good stuff comes from. Yeah. I just bought a building. My wife and I, she's a mental health therapist and she rents out individual office spaces to other therapists. So kind of like a salon lofts, but for therapists. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So she, we've got one building. She's got, it's a hundred percent full. She's always having people that want more office space. So we just bought a place down here in German village close to me. And it was two old German village brick homes that they somehow attached and created a one big commercial office building that was turned into like bland, awful medical space. Uh, you know, just like the 12 by 12 linoleum tiles that are just, you know, <laughs> bad. all the brick has been covered up with, with drywall. <laughs> so we're in the process now of just completely renovating that, taking down all the drywall, exposing the brick and cleaning it yeah. up. And I love projects like that where you can bring the soul back yeah, from these, exactly, these exactly. old buildings. So, yeah, it's really, it's really hard to do otherwise. And you can, you can, um, you know, you can imagine that, that any building, no matter how horrible has the ability to do that. And, and so there's, you know, when we're doing our projects, that's the first thing. If there's an existing building, there is a bonus to that of like, here's something that we can riff off of. And here's, we can, you know, take, use this as a, as a centerpiece. And maybe it's just taking the, taking the walls off and creating a pavilion or, or, you know, maybe it's, you know, taking part of the building, opening up part of the building or putting something next to it that completely changes the vibe or creates a courtyard between the two. And it's, it's those kind of things that add the energy that create this, you know, halo effect that we're talking about. Definitely. I wanted to ask you about dinner and drinks, LLC. I, I was on your website doing some research <laughs> and there's a mention of dinner and drinks, LLC. I you know, know you like to, I know you like dinner, you like <laughs> drinks. Tell me about dinner and drinks, LLC. Uh, yeah, that's our, that's a, uh, you know, investment vehicle partnership that we use to invest into actual operating companies in the restaurant world. So we've made four or five investments in that where we, you know, team up with a really terrific operator who has got everything going for him, but, but lacks capital. And so we're always on the, on the lookout for, for those kind of people. And that's also been a help to our real estate business is when you can understand, you know, all the difficulties that go into running the operating business that might otherwise be your tenant, you can, it, it gives you the ability to be a better operator on the real estate side. And it's been very enlightening of what we thought we knew versus, you know, actually living it and understanding it and getting a, getting a better, better feel for it. So that's been a fun uh, diversion for us as well. You had mentioned, I think in the Chris Powers interview, the guy that has a restaurant that rents from you and he, I don't know if he fell behind or you were going to offer him some leniency, maybe three months free rent or something like that. And he was like, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, I've saved up for a rainy day. I'm going to take care of my <laughs> responsibilities. Whereas like some of the bigger companies, corporate companies were not very honorable. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, well, yeah, that was, uh, I think the, I think the pandemic and the, the uncertainty that came from that was really amazing to watch of what happened. We, we have a property that had 50, you know, small businesses as tenants and through that, you know, incredible roller coaster ride of the pandemic. I don't think that we had, we didn't have, it, uh, everybody paid their rent eventually. Um, I think there was some stuff that, you know, where we worked with folks, I'm sure for a short period of time, but everybody, you know, ended up paying. We were all, you know, in a way in it together. And we had another property that was the majority occupied by, you know, national brands that are disagreeable folks to deal with, to begin with, and then to have, but you only do it because of the idea that when, you know, it hits the fan that you would, uh, no matter what, be able to collect the rent. And then what we, what we found is that those were the, uh, most horrible people to deal with throughout the, uh, throughout the pandemic. 
I thought that would be a longer lived uh, phenomenon and it would influence, I kind of hope that it would influence people's willingness to do business with some of these companies. But I don't think it will. But but yeah, I think the, the idea of these, there's a lot of power in locally owned businesses where people are have skin in the game that becomes their livelihood. And if you can help them uh, survive and help them thrive, it creates a, it creates a terrific uh, thing for, for community. Charles. Yeah. And loyalty, you know, t- I would think. Yeah, that's right. That's right. For sure. For anyone that has, is even on the fence, reconvene is a, is a unbelievable venue that Moses Kagan has created and brings together a, at a small scale is a terrific group of interesting people that are doing really amazing things, most of them at a very young age. And it's completely inspiring. Over that, whatever it was, three or four days, I packed a couple of years worth of learning stuff <laughs> into, into that. And so I would recommend as much as it is possible to recommend if anybody's on the fence about doing that, that they should that they should absolutely do it and they should absolutely uh, breathe it in and embrace it and get it squeeze out every drop of nectar from it that they can. And it was designed for GPs, LPs, a little bit of, I mean, there was all kinds of people. There was Nick Huber was there, the self-storage guy. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, there were several different people there that you, you were a guest speaker, obviously. I th- Yeah, I think it's, it sort of attracted this idea of people – doing things that need capital and people that have capital looking for people doing things. And the group was talented and ambitious and fun and smart. And the event is put together in a way that it, it drops to the ground, all the normal stiffness that you might find on some sort of a, of a convention. And it's, it's almost like, you know, a club, made up of old friends. And, uh, and so it's really terrific to, to a great chance to, to meet people, learn, and then create relationships that would, you know, go on for, for, I think a long time. Was there anyone from reconvene that you walked away with saying, wow, they are up to some cool stuff that, or, you know, like, I'd love to be a part of that. Or if I was a young guy, I'd be Pl- plenty of them. You know, there's this, uh, uh, there's this cat, Winton Grant, who's a world-class violinist who's also <laughs> doing real estate. There's um, some incredible investors there that that I've gotten to know that have been uh, really terrific and in, in, um, that I've learned a lot from. There are people that are doing really good things like providing, you know, affordable housing for folks that need it. It's a it's an incredible assortment of interesting folks in a way that I've not experienced it before. So yeah, it's a, it's a really terrific terrific uh, venue. Yeah. So I wanted to touch on how you're spending the bulk of your time right now. Yeah, we we've got um, this idea of you know creating these catalytic projects solves a couple of problems. So for the for the typical, we, we've got an architect that we do a lot of work with who has sort of become known as you know the restaurant guy in in atlanta or or one of the one of them and so he said here's the here's what happens is people call me all the time and they have this idea for their restaurant and he says great tell me about it and they do and he says okay you know what's your timing and they say oh you know if we could have the plans done we're in no rush but if we could have by next week that would be great <laughs> you know something preposterous and so he says okay here's the deal you're going to pay me 40 or 50 thousand dollars we're going to come up with a schematic set of plans and that's probably going to take 90 to maybe 120 days maybe longer depends on the back and forth that we have then we're going to take that, and we're going to we're going to get some buy-in from a from a uh, from a contractor, and that's going to go on for another I don't even know maybe uh, three or four months. Then we're going to take it to the city, 
and the city's going to um, want to have their way in. And at some point, you're going to get we're going to get permits, and we're going to get our entitlements, and we'll go under construction. And that'll probably take you know, depending on the scope, if it's ground up or a rehab, you know, six months to twenty four months. And then at that point, you're going to know what it cost. And now, do you have two million dollars to pay for this? Mr. Restaurateur, oh, you don't. Okay, well, do you have a home? Because the bank's going to want that as collateral. Oh, you don't have a home? Well, does your mom have a home? Okay, well, they'll take that. She's going to need to pledge it, but if you don't pay us on time, we're going to take that from her. Are you ready to get started? So it's a it's a daunting uh, exercise that the, that the independent restaurateur needs to go through. And so part of what we're solving for in a backhanded way, is we're smoothing that process and saying, hey, we've got cool space and you can be open on Thursday. I'm exaggerating, but not that much. And then then the other thing that we're solving for, which is the bigger thing, is property owners, and that can be ourselves, need more than anything, want desirability. And if you own properties, (laughs) you want it to to be desirable. That's where all the money is. Uh, you want value, and the more desirable it is, the more valuable it is. So by taking, by solving the problem for these independent restaurateurs, we also solve the problem for a lot of communities that might be stuck with the, you know, mattress firm, Dollar General sort of thing that you are alluding to, giving them this place that they can, you know, gather as a community. And by doing that, that creates this desirability for the surrounding real estate. So we're sort of getting into that, helping create that ecosystem for all the market participants. And then we eke out the value in the delta of what it was before to what it can be when it's sort of fully realized. I feel like I could go on for about another hour asking you questions (laughs) about all this, but I know you've got a busy day here, so we're going to wrap it up here. But I don't think I've done justice to really explain how beautiful your projects are. I really encourage our listeners to go onto your website and look at some of these case studies that you've got listed. They're beautiful and and really projects I'm, I would be very proud to have been the developer on. So <laughs> Very um, kind. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Eric, for your time today. How could listeners reach out and get in touch with you or learn more about you? Well, you can go to our you can go to our website hwproperties.com. You can uh, uh, hit me up through there on the email. You can do it on uh, Twitter at at io non recourse. All of those. Uh, I love uh, you know meeting folks and and spreading the spreading the word. Cool. Thanks so much for being with us today, Eric. Okay, man. Thank you. I just add one point that I think is super important about networking, and that is follow up. People do so much networking and then they never follow up. I mean, I've probably met a hundred people once. I can walk around a city and redevelop sites in my head as I'm walking around the city. It's just intuitive to me.